Okay, thank you for having me here today. Um, this is an enormous screen. It's going to be a challenge to point at. So, uh, so thank thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about a really fun and interesting topic of the outer solar system, which is what I want to research in a really horrible, depressing topic of uh, mega constellations, which are there no matter what I do. Uh, and I want to quickly do my own land acknowledgement. Um, I uh, live and work on Treaty 4 territory. I am very glad to uh, be here on Treaty 7 territory. I appreciate these huge prairie skies that I, I get to share. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, a lot of the data that I'm going to talk about was taken from telescopes on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which is sacred to indigenous Hawaiians. And I'm really grateful to be able to observe from that amazing mountain. Um, okay, so let's start simple. Pluto. Um, Pluto was a planet for a very long time. And part of the reason for this was because uh, it was discovered many decades before the second Kuiper Belt object. So uh, for those many decades, uh, it was thought that would be possibly the only object out there. Uh, but now we know there are thousands of them. Uh, we also know a lot more about Pluto than we did uh, when it was first discovered, right? It has gone from a point to a fuzzy dot to a few fuzzy dots to a resolved, amazing world, right? The New Horizons probe flew past Pluto in 2015 and took absolutely stunning images. It's it's just incredible. Um, uh, I love seeing these zoomed in pictures of the, the surface, right? Uh, Pluto is a world with active geology, right? Uh, there are, are mountains uh, that are made out of water ice. Pluto is so cold that there are also glaciers made out of nitrogen ice, right? Nitrogen is most of the air that we're breathing right now, but on Pluto, it's so cold uh, that it becomes a solid. And you can see that uh, these these water ice mountains float around on top of the, these uh, nitrogen ice glaciers that are slowly um, uh, convecting like, like a bowl of oatmeal, right? It's, it's amazing. Um, uh, I love this. It looks like a computer generated image. This is an actual photo of Pluto from a spacecraft going by it, right? You can see uh, these water ice mountains. You can, uh, you can see very thin layers of atmosphere, right? Pluto is a world, it's amazing, but it's not a planet. <laughs> uh, we know uh, there, are, there are many reasons why it's not a planet. Um, it has a really wonky orbit compared to the rest of the solar system, right? It's very tilted, it's very squished, it is not in a nice plane like the rest of the planets. It's also very small, right? Here it is compared to Canada, right? Uh, Pluto and its uh, very large moon, Charon. Uh, it, it's really small. Um, uh, special shout out to uh, R.L. McNish if you're here. Uh, thank you for making this lovely diagram that I use all the time in my teaching. Uh, so, so this is another reason that Pluto is not a planet, is that there are all these other uh, Kuiper Belt objects, trans-Neptunian objects, that have been discovered that are almost the same size as Pluto, right? Uh, Eris is actually known to be slightly smaller in radius, but it is way more massive than Pluto. Uh, and the discovery of Eris is what got Pluto demoted officially. Um, so there's a lot out there, right? Uh, these are all known dwarf planets. There might be one or two that we still haven't found. Uh, so these, these, uh, this new category is uh, large enough to pull itself into a round shape with its gravity, but not large enough to clear its orbit of similarly sized bodies. Um, okay, so before I talk about uh, what we know about the Kuiper Belt, a little bit of terminology. Um, so. Trans-Neptunian object, Kuiper Belt object, these are two terms that I'm going to use interchangeably. They're just small icy bodies, uh, primarily beyond the orbit of Neptune. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about orbits, so a little refresher if you haven't thought about this for a while. 
Uh, eccentricity defines how squished is an orbit, right? A uh, perfect circle is zero. Earth's orbit is something like 0.01 eccentricity. Pluto's 0.24. Uh, and then pericentering, I've used this term a lot. Pericenter is the closest point in the orbit to the sun. Um, so uh, you, you can, there, there's also apocenter, which is the farthest point. Uh, you can remember which is which because perilously close. Um, inclination is just how tilted is an orbit relative to the plane of the solar system. Uh, this, this one's fairly straightforward. Pluto is tilted by about 17 degrees per reference. And then some of your axes, how big is an orbit? Um, Earth is uh, has a centimeter axis of one astronomical unit, one AU. Uh, it's a really convenient unit for talking about orbits in the solar system. Uh, Neptune has an orbit of about 30 AU, right? So 30 times larger than Earth's orbit. Uh, the main part of the Kuiper belt, um, where most Kuiper belt objects, well, where the densest part of the Kuiper belt, of the Kuiper belt is, uh, is about 40 to 42 AU. Uh, and one of the most distant known Kuiper belt objects uh, is Sedna. Uh, so Sedna has a paracenter, right, its closest point to the sun, at 76 AU. Its farthest point from the sun is more than 900 AU. Uh, to give you an idea of how far this is, right, so Voyager 1 has been flying away from the sun faster than a bullet for longer than I've been alive, and it's only at 163 AU, right? Uh, this is really far, really, really far away from the sun. But there's stuff that's even farther out there, right? There's the Oort cloud. Um, so this is something like 10,000 to 100,000-ish AU, basically halfway to the next star. Um, and we know about these objects uh, because sometimes they come in close to the sun and they melt and they look really pretty as comets. So we know that these are out there. We cannot see them when they're this far away. We can only see them when they're in close. Okay, so back to the Kuiper belt. Um, so uh, so how do we how do we find these? <laughs> um, so we use very large telescopes. So my team. Uh, we uh, get to use the Canada France Hawaii telescope on Mauna Kea. Um, and we find these the same way that Pluto was discovered. Right? We take a picture of a spot on the sky, uh, wait an hour or so, come back, take another picture, another hour, come back, take another picture, uh, and watch for things to move. And um, we're fortunate that we have software that <laughs> finds the moving objects for us, so we don't have to sit and look at all of them, which is great, unlike uh, Clyde, Clyde Tomba. Um, and once we have those motions on the sky, we can start measuring orbits, right? So, so just the motion on one night, right? So this is this is like two hours of data um, that tells us how far away it is. Uh, but in order to actually calculate the orbit, you have to follow. I mean, sorry, it's over here. You have to follow that that Kuiper belt object. You have to track it across the sky over the course of years. Uh, to get better and better measurements of its orbit. And uh, this is there's a lot of math involved in this uh, that computers are very good at. <laughs> um, so how many, how many capable objects are there out there? Um, so this is a de-biased measurement of how many capable objects there are. So all of these tiny little dots represent real capable objects on their approximate statistical orbit. Um, so we measure that there are 400,000 Kuiper Belt objects bigger than 100 kilometers in diameter. Um, but how many of these do we actually know? <laughs> That's a very different kind of picture. Um, so we know about 3,000. Uh, some of these have been lost because uh, they weren't tracked for long enough. So their orbital uncertainties are really large. Um, but what I want you all in the audience to do what are the different so so this plot here so the, the big big dots are actual real objects right and there's a whole bunch in here um you just ignore those just look at these ones that are in the the main type of and the, all these this dotted line stuff around the edges is uh their orbits over time um so what differences do you see in the distributions of the real 
measurement and the D bias orbits. Do you see any big differences? There's clumping, yeah. There's hold, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So, uh, so this, this is nice, nice smooth distribution, right? Um, this is clumpy, it's got holes in it, right? Uh, there are all sorts of observational biases built into this, but what's really cool, and I'm glad we have a giant screen to do this on, uh, we can see how these will move over time, right? So if we didn't discover any more hyperbolic objects, uh, this is how those 3,000 or so that we know would move over the course of the next century, right? Um, so you can see those clumps actually kind of shear out over time, right? Um, the clumps are just uh, an observation bias, right? Like they were discovered, right? So we're way in here, right? Looking out through the solar system. Those clumps are where somebody got a lot of time to look in one particular direction uh, and find find built objects that way. Um, okay. Uh, so there are a lot of observing biases that are wrapped up in that plot, right? Um, uh, and these are really important <laughs> for understanding the real distribution of hyperbolic objects. Um, one really big one is, uh, so hyperbolic objects aren't like stars. We see them in reflected light, right? So light from the sun has to go all the way out to the hyperbolic object, reflect all the way back to the earth, which is basically at the sun for the purposes of this, right? So as every time the Kuiper object gets a little bit farther away, its brightness drops off as one over distance to the fourth power. So if you, if you have a Kuiper Belt object that's 10 times farther away, it's going to be 10,000 times fainter, right? We're very much biased toward finding the closest ones. Um, and then because of orbital dynamics, right? Kepler's law, Kepler's second law, equal areas and equal times, we know that um, Kepler Belt objects that are on very eccentric orbits uh, where they're close into the sun, where they're brightest, they spend the least time, right? Um, but we can account for this, right? We know these are biases that we know about. Um, okay, so, so another bias that uh, some of you noticed that isn't talked about so much um, are, are these gaps in the distribution of known type of belt objects, right? You can see really prominent gaps in, in I mean, there's, there's a few type of belt objects in there, but not nearly as many as there are over in these uh, kind of orthogonal directions. Um, that is the Milky Way, right? <laughs> Across the sky. Um, so he, I, love, I love this picture here because you can see the plane of the solar system, right? Just because of the configuration of, uh, of the solar system at the time, you can see the Milky Way is uh, inclined by about 60 degrees, cutting through part of the solar system, right? Um, it is really hard to find small fuzzy moving dots in front of even more small fuzzy dots, right? Um, so we just don't even try a lot of the time in those two directions because it's too hard. Um, so those are biases that are in every single hyperbelt survey that has ever been done. And that's really important to keep in mind. Um, okay, so we talked about how they're discovered. Let's talk more about orbits. Um, so Pluto has, uh, like I said, a kind of wobbly orbit. Um, it's in a special kind of mean motion resonance. So it can actually cross Neptune's orbit without it crashing. We can explain how Pluto's orbit got there. We can also explain how uh, the, the densest part of the Kuiper belt got there. It just formed there. That makes sense. Pluto, we can explain it got captured when Neptune migrated. That's a whole other talk. Um, uh, Eris is an example of a Kuiper belt object. It gets close enough to Neptune at some point in its orbit that we can explain its current orbit with some kind of gravitational scattering event that happened in the past. But what about Sedna? <laughs> Sedna never gets close enough to Neptune to explain its orbit, right? And it's not on a nice circular orbit uh, like you would expect if it formed there. Uh, it's way out here, right? It never gets closer to Neptune than 46 AU away. That is not close enough for uh, gravitational scattering to do anything. So how did it get there? <laughs> um, so this is where these high paracenter TNOs, high, so, um, so, so this is orbit size, so some major axis, right? 
uh, and paracenter distance, how close do they get to the sun? So, so Neptune would be like uh, way over there, somewhere on this plot, right? Um, uh, so here's here's Sedna, right? That that really weird one. Um, and uh, so these are all Kuiper Belt objects that were discovered in different surveys that have different biases, but they all have this Milky Way bias built into them. Um, and uh, okay, so uh, so the very highest paracenter ones, if you just plot where they are in the solar system, you get a picture like this. Um, so this is uh, the the Planet Nine theory. Um, so the the most distant, the highest paracenter Kuiper Belt objects, the ones that are hardest to find, have the most biases built into finding them. They're all on one side of the solar system, which is super interesting. And uh, there was a really great paper that talked about um, really intense dynamics that you can use to constrain all these little guys to be on one side of the solar system if you have a giant planet that's at like 500 AU, so it's really far away from the sun and like 10 times the mass of the Earth. So big planet. Uh, and so far away that we maybe haven't discovered it yet. So that is the Planet Nine theory. Um, but the question that I want to know the answer to is, well, these really distant high person or Kuiper Belt objects, um, if you look at kind of, you know, this is where they were discovered, right? So uh, is, are there actually none over here or did nobody look, right? Because that's not something that astronomers like to publish. Oh yeah, I got all this time on a telescope and I didn't find anything, right? You don't write that paper. so. Uh, so that's not something that uh, often gets talked about. Um, only in surveys like the Outer Solar System's Origin Survey, um, where uh, we really keep careful track of our, our biases like that and publish them. Okay, so I want to show you. Okay, so, so this is from 2015, right? This is all of them that were known in 2016. Uh, I want to compare it with all of them that have been discovered. I think there's only one more uh, since 2020 uh, when I last updated this plot. I'm going to rotate this around so that it matches my plot. And this is all of them that have been discovered uh, now. So, uh, so, so all the gray ones are just from this database, right, where you don't know what the biases are. The red ones are from uh, the Outer Solar System Origin Survey, uh, where we know the biases. And what and you can see like there's one going in the opposite direction. There's one that's 90 degrees away from this, this big clustering, right? Um, those are statistically consistent with a uniform distribution. Uh, the blue ones are from another survey, the Dark Energy Survey, that also kept very careful track of their biases. And they also find uh, that that distribution with their biases is statistically consistent with a uniform distribution. So, um, if you actually look at, so this is looking down on the solar system, uh, and we're just interested in those, the red dots are the high paracenter hypervolt objects. Where are they in the solar system? The white dots are where we could have found these if they existed, right? And you can see that that pretty much matches up. Right? You only see the red dots where you have white, white bands, right? Uh, there's none over here, right? There's none over here. Or the one over here. Um, and uh, so you find them where you look for them, which seems really obvious, but it's not. <laughs> These observing biases are, are really insidious. And so right here, kind of in these directions, is the Milky Way, right? So that's where people haven't looked very well. And over here is the winter on Mauna Kea. And it's just really hard to get good observing time then. Uh, so nobody's looked, right? So these biases are in all of the surveys. Um, I did a very silly simulation where I said, okay, so here's the real clustering, sorry, different orientation again. Uh, this is the real six clustered hyperbolic objects. And this is just a bunch of random orbits that look like those high paracenter hyperbolic objects. And um, what if we just got observing time from Chile in the fall? What would that look like? And the first six that you detect are clustered just because of when you get your observing time, right? So these, these biases are, are insidious and really important to, to keep track of, or, uh, right, the, the simpler explanation is not that we have missed this giant planet in the outer solar system. The simpler explanation is uh, nobody looked in that direction, right? And we need to keep better track of that. So 
Uh, it's still super interesting though, right? Um, and it really doesn't explain, like, uh, if Planet Nine exists, it does not explain these two objects. If Planet Nine doesn't exist, it doesn't explain those two objects, right? Like, it doesn't help with a bit this. So, uh, all of these other ones on this plot, we can explain with known orbital dynamics. Uh, but those, those two off in the corner by themselves, uh, we, we don't know. We actually have no idea how, how they got there. But there's a lot of theories about how, how, uh, how we could do this, uh, right? Um, theories range from extra planets, planets that stick around for just, uh, just part of the solar system's history. Uh, uh, you know, so they could be captured from another solar system that passed by us in the past. There could be a star that flew by, right? There's all these other possibilities for how to get those orbits. Um, but all of those require more than two tests, right? We need to find more of these in surveys where we know the biases really well. So this is what we're trying to do, right? So, uh, so the Outer Solar System Origin Survey uh, ran from 2013 to 2018. Um, we have just started a new survey uh, that a lot of the same people are collaborating on, a lot of the same team, uh, and we're trying to go deeper. We're trying to, uh, to instead of just uh, watching things move, uh, we, we stare at the same spot for hours, for three hours at a time, and then shift all the images and staff them at different rates to go really, really deep. So very computationally expensive, um, but really powerful. We can find much fainter, much more distant objects. Um, so uh, so uh, I, I'm co-leading this along with uh, Wes Fraser. And uh, so so here's right that, that clustering plot again. Uh, and this is our planned, planned survey directions, right? So these pie slices are where we want to look, right? We want our, we, so we have only have these six little tiny slices through the solar system, but they're all spread around the solar system. So we want, we want all directions uh, to try to test whether this clustering is real or not. Um, so year one was a complete success. We actually, so sorry, there's a lot going on in this plot. Um, the, the, the red pie slices are classy. Um, so we got all of these, including, right? So remember I said winter on Mauna Kea? That's this part. We got, uh, this is January, February on, on Mauna Kea. Uh, and, and we got it. It was so exciting. Um, got beautiful data in January and February last year. And then this year the telescope broke. And it's very sad. Uh, and we're waiting where we they might fix it at the end of this month, and we might be able to follow up uh, in the next dark run. Uh, but we don't know yet. So that's a little stressful. Ground based observing is, is very stressful sometimes, as you all know. Um, <laughs> but now it's getting even more stressful, right? Um, so this is another bias that, that is uh, creeping into our, our surveys. Um, so this is. Uh, this is one of our, our images from the Canada France Hawaii telescope. This is a stack, sorry, it's not showing up quite as well in here, um, but it, it's a stack of three hours of data. So there's, you can see some like vertical lines. Those, that's normal um, expected uh, bleeding from very bright stars. All of the diagonal lines that you can see, those are all satellites that, that flew through uh, the field of view in those, those three hours. And uh, the satellites are millions of times brighter than the hyperbolic objects that we're trying to find. So, so this is um, one of our really deep stacks. Uh, uh, you can see the hyperbolic object moving across. And uh, our automated software actually missed this one initially because of that super bright satellite flying through. So we actually have to change how we're processing our data because of the actions of a private company. Um, so why, why is this happening? Um, so uh, this is primarily driven by Starlink right now. Um, they're, they're launching batches of 60 satellites at least once a, a week. Um, there's uh, currently 5,614 satellites. I didn't actually check today. Maybe they launched more. Um, they launched more than 6,000 already. Um, and uh, I just want to very quickly make it clear that uh, 
all satellites are not the problem here. Science satellites are not the problem, right? There's a whole bunch of science satellites in orbit that are, are these cute little microsats or nanosats, right? Um, there's maybe a couple hundred of them. Uh, and uh, they are not big enough to cause any problems for us. Uh, there's a few science satellites that are, you know, truck size satellites, uh, like a space telescope. Um, there's a few dozen uh, Earth observation satellites. Uh, satellites like JWST are not in low Earth orbit, so they are not causing problems for us, right? Um, the problem is uh, these new uh, low Earth uh, orbit satellites that are being launched. Um, they're really big. They're in much lower orbits than past satellites. And there are a lot of them. It's happening very quickly. Um, so the base of these Starlink satellites is uh, the size and almost the mass of a standard Ford F-150, right? And they're being launched in huge batches, right? It used to be that satellites would be launched one at a time, uh, but they're being launched uh, dozens at a time. Um, so all of the problems that I'm going to talk about are, are caused by uh, the fact that these satellites are very big. Uh, they are in low Earth orbit instead of higher uh, orbits. And uh, just there's so many of them. Um, and, you know, I just like have to keep going back to, uh, you know, astronomy is probably the most ancient science, right? We've been looking up at the sky noticing patterns, noticing natural patterns in the sky that tell us, you know, when to plant crops, when to hunt certain foods, uh, when the equinox is coming, right? Um, and suddenly, uh, these natural patterns are being overwhelmed by human-made patterns. Um, you know, we were already, a lot of uh, the population of the world has lost access to the night sky because of uh, urban light pollution, right? Um, a big part of this is, is LEDs, right? LEDs are great because they use less energy uh, and they're cheaper, uh, but that means that they're massively overused because they're so cheap. Uh, so, so there's been a huge jump in light pollution just over the last five years even. Um, but you can get away from that, right? Um, even here in super, super bright Calgary, uh, you can drive for, I don't know how long that would be, uh, like three hours maybe to get out there. Um, you can drive out three hours and you can get pretty dark skies. You can drive for six hours and get to some of the best skies in North America, right? Um, you, you can you can do that. Um, but satellites, you cannot get away from them. They are visible everywhere in the world. Um, and uh, Starlink is going so fast, uh, right? So 5,600. Uh, that are currently in orbit, uh, they're made fast and cheap, so many of them have failed already. Uh, and, and they are almost 60% of all satellites, like all total satellites, including all orbit altitudes, right? So one private company uh, owned by one kind of horrible person now effectively controls orbit. Uh, that happened very quickly over the last five years, right? Uh, and they have permission to launch and operate 42,000. Uh, and, and I'm going to complain a lot about Starlink because they're the first, but there are many other companies that are lined up to do the same thing, including one that wants to do 300,000 satellites, right? Um, there was a recent paper that uh, went through all the filings and counted up 1 million planned satellites, right? Uh, as an orbital dynamicist, I will just say there is no way we can safely have 1 million satellites in orbit. No way. Um, and these are these are to provide uh, global internet, right? Um, so uh, you know, there's this this plot is showing um, cost of internet versus GDP. Uh, how much money do people have to spend on internet access uh, versus how many people in each country have access to the internet already? Um, so where it is affordable and where it is needed is this corner of the plot with the legend in it. Um, there are no countries in that corner of the plot. Uh, this is, of course, a huge oversimplification, right? Uh, the difference between uh, urban and rural Canadian internet access is huge, but it's just one dot on here. Um, but the, the point here is just like, this is not a charity, right? They're, they're not giving away internet. They're not bringing internet to underserved countries. This is uh, this is a for-profit company. Um, there's also, also, I didn't even go into the, um, 
even weirder uh, Ukraine SpaceX headlines. Uh, but uh, this is just a lot of power for a one person uh, to have. And uh, so we're in a bad situation right now, uh, both in orbit and with uh, information access. Um, so the reason that I started worrying about this, as I showed you in my, my data, um, uh, these, these satellites are really big and they're really reflective uh, and they stay lit up long after sun, sunset, um, right? So there's a nice little animation uh, that is maybe going to work. Oh no, I'll try again. Oh no, it's not working, sorry. Um, but so, uh, so so these these satellites are um uh, so, so they just reflect sunlight for a long time um how bright are they uh so uh so some of you are very, very familiar with magnitude some of you maybe not so much anything that is smaller than uh than six and a half is what you can see with your eyes from a really dark place um so the first starling satellites were like you could see them from like maybe darkish suburbs, which is super bright for astronomy research, right? Um, but Starlink, to their credit, they did um, try some mitigations to make them darker, uh, which they quickly stopped doing. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the mitigations they tried did make them fainter. Um, uh, the newest ones are bigger, like the, each generation they launch is, is uh, larger and larger, right? The newest ones, which they haven't even started launching yet, are, are as big as Ford F 150s. Uh, and um, they, they have some new coding that SpaceX says will make them really dark. But we don't actually know until they get up there and we measure them. Um, okay, so even with the mitigations that they first tried, more than half of them were still naked eye visible. Um, and all of them were uh, brighter than magnitude seven, which is what causes serious problems for research telescopes. Um, the Vera Rubin Observatory in particular has said that anything brighter than magnitude seven will destroy entire images, not just where the, the satellite flies through. Um, and then astronomers spent all this time talking to Starlink, please, please, please make your satellites fainter, please, please, please. And then another company that I don't think any astronomers had heard of, AST Mobile uh, launched a, a satellite with the footprint of a small house. Um, and uh, it is as bright as the brightest stars in the sky. Uh, so we really need regulation. <laughs> they want to launch a hundred more of these. Um, so this is what um, these satellites do to your beautiful astro photos, right? Um, as you have your long time exposure photos, many satellites fly through your field of view. Uh, they're following each other in this sort of grid pattern, so you get a grid pattern in your photos. Um, when you actually count up uh, all of the naked eye visible satellites, the vast majority of them are starlings because they're so big and in such low altitude orbits. And uh, of course, yeah, this is much worse for, uh, for research telescopes with very large collecting areas and very sensitive cameras. Uh, I, I hear the argument a lot, well, why don't you just send all your telescopes into space. Maybe you just don't do ground-based astronomy anymore. Uh, these are satellite streaks in Hubble Space Telescope images, right? Uh, Hubble space, the Hubble Space Telescope is in the same orbit as Starlink. Uh, also, and so JWST will not have this problem uh, because it's in an Earth-trailing orbit, but it was a $10 billion telescope. I don't see anybody lining up to give us $10 billion for another one. And then, okay, <laughs> Starlink train. How many of you have seen a Starlink train? Oh, okay, yeah, many of you, okay, yeah. Uh, the first time I saw one, I was blown away. It's like, I study this. I have modeled how bright they are, and I still, I think I yelled. <laughs> like, I was really, really surprised, right? Uh, how many of you have gotten UFO calls from your friends and neighbors? <laughs> Nobody? Oh, okay, okay, good, some of you. Uh, I get them all the time. I get weird emails. Um, uh, there's this great uh, article in the New York Times about how, like, everybody's losing their minds during the pandemic. Um, it's all Starlink, right? It's all Starlink. And they're doing nothing to teach the general public how they're changing the night sky. It's uh, very frustrating. Okay, so how bad did we get? Um, this is uh, a set of uh, simulations that I ran with, uh, with my collaborators uh, with 65,000 satellites, which at the time I thought was ridiculous, but now I know it's actually an underestimate. Uh, 
This is uh, four companies on the, the orbit that they have planned, that they have asked for. Uh, so we're not just making up the distribution. This is what they want. Um, and this is an all Canadian team. Uh, we used uh, data from the Plaskett Telescope in Victoria uh, to, to calibrate our models. Um, and uh, so how bright, how bright will it be? Uh, we, we, have, we have a model that's calibrated to data. We have uh, you know, real uh, orbits that have been asked for. Of course, they've changed since we published it because they change it all the time, but uh, still pretty representative. Uh, we uh, uh, model the orbits uh, using an open source n-body integrator. All of our code is online. If any of you who want to go play with it, it's there. There's also a great um, mega constellations a uh, free app written by uh, my collaborator, Hannah Ryan. Uh, that's a really horrifying visualization. Um, okay, so here, here are the models. Um, some of you have seen this before, but I'm gonna make you look at it again, I'm sorry. Uh, so each of these is an all sky plot, um, right? So here's east, south, you know, eastern horizon, southern horizon, western horizon, that's your zenith. Um, the dots are uh, sunlit satellites that are in your sky and up right there. So anything that's uh, pink, orange, or yellow is naked eye visible. Um, and so here's the winter solstice, the equinox, the summer solstice. Uh, here's evening. Uh, so just just when it's get, getting just sorry, just after it gets dark, midnight. And uh, just before it starts getting late in the morning, right? So this is Hawaii, uh, where uh, the research telescope that I use is is located. Um, this is uh, latitude 50, so this is what Calgary will look like. Um, uh, so this is uh, the number of visible satellites, right? So on the summer solstice, you will have a couple hundred naked eye visible satellites all night long. Um, which you know the nights are short, but. Uh, Oh, it's not going to let me play the video either. Okay, um, I'll I'll come back to that at the end if, if there's time. Uh, but you can just see how how it changes over the course of the night. Uh, just and this is all just due to the geometry of the sun and the orbits that these companies have chosen to use. Um, if satellites use fewer, if if companies use fewer satellites, uh, uh, then <laughs> this will be much less terrible. Um, but even if you go to the North Pole, you can't get away from these satellites, right? Uh, Grassland National Park, you'll be able to see more of them than in the city, right? Uh, so uh, these, these satellites are changing the night sky for everyone, regardless of whether or not you can afford to purchase Starlink internet. Um, okay, so, so that, that's the, um, the uh, light pollution part of it. Uh, but there's actually some parts that make me worry a lot more. Uh, right, low Earth orbit is getting very, very crowded. So uh, this is showing the number of uh, stuff in orbit, right? So uh, so functional satellites, abandoned rocket bodies, and uh, just fragments of debris that are big enough to be tracked, right? Um, and there's a few a few events on here that caused a whole bunch of debris, but you can see it's just going up, right? It is it is not not going down. Um, this is a different way of looking at that uh, distribution. Uh, so altitude versus density. Uh, so guess where Starlink is? <laughs> the the highest density um, plot, or the highest density part of uh, this plot, right? The highest density in orbital space that has ever existed. Let's see if this will let me go. Uh, oh, I don't have internet, Never mind. I forgot to get internet beforehand. Anyway, so there, there's, if you're interested later, I can show you there's a great, um, uh, terrifying, uh, real uh, objects in orbit and their conjunctions. So the closest approaches between objects and in any moment, there, there are, in, in the next few minutes, there will be several close approaches less than a kilometer, uh, definitely less than two kilometers. Um, right, which sounds like really far apart, but everything in orbit is traveling at several kilometers per second, right? We're having near misses all the time already, and they're just at, they're going to add tens of thousands more satellites to that highest density part of orbit. Um, and uh, we're coming up to the solar maximum, right? Uh, solar storms in the past have knocked out satellites. 
I have asked um, people outside, like, what are your plans? What happens? Uh, it because Starlink felt like they're in such a dense orbit, they have to change their orbits all the time to not crash into each other. What happens if you get knocked out for a few hours? And they say, it won't happen. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, there's also a huge amount of uh, pollution on launch, um, right? Uh, just the number of launch number time has just uh, skyrocketed, I guess. Uh, um, uh, and and all of these, you know, even water vapor in the stratosphere, which is supposed to be very very dry, uh, causes uh, weird chemical reactions to happen. Uh, we've seen uh, noctilucent clouds have increased dramatically. Um, we know that the atmosphere is changing as a result of uh, all these increased launches. Um, the part that actually worries me a lot more is the re-entries, though. Um, so uh, Starlink in particular is planning to make their satellites disposable, right? Um, they're planning for 42,000 satellites to be replaced every five years. Uh, so if you just do the math on that, that's 23 satellites per day on average, right? Like a satellite per hour that they're gonna burn up in the upper atmosphere. Um, uh, so, so this is um, so 29 tons per day, uh, it's you know about half the the normal amount of uh, meteoroids that that burn up in Earth's atmosphere, uh, but uh, but it's mostly aluminum, right? It's, it, so what is that going to do, right? When we're adding uh, many many tons of aluminum to the upper atmosphere, right? Like that mass doesn't go away; it's it's there in the upper atmosphere. Um, so that that experiment has already started. Um, there was a paper last year that uh, they measured aerosols in the upper atmosphere. 10% of stratospheric aerosols are already from satellite and rocket re-entries. Um, so we've already started, uh, you know, this is a, the hockey stick of um, re-entered satellites, right? We're, we're just, we're right there. So, uh, so this is gonna change very quickly and nobody's studying this. <laughs> um, there are bigger pieces that make it to the ground too, right? Um, there are many, many uh, pieces of junk. Nobody has been injured yet, uh, but it's really only a matter of time. And it's not even clear legally what happens, right? Like, what happens if a SpaceX rocket lands on somebody's house in Brazil? We don't know. <laughs> this is a legal gray area. The only time it was tested was, was in the late 1970s when a uh, Soviet nuclear powered satellite sprayed nuclear waste across northern Canada. And there was a whole, whole diplomatic incident about that. The Soviet Union did pay Canada some small fine, but it was not enough. Um, so it's not even clear if these rules that were set up in the Apollo space race era even apply to private corporations. Um, so yeah, so we need like this is this is the time when when these these rules were set up. There's no new ones. We need new ones, and there are talks about this at the UN level, but it's super slow. So what can all of you do? <laughs> um, right, we absolutely need international regulation of satellites, uh, and it, people are working on it, but it is not happening fast enough. Right. Meanwhile, SpaceX is launching 60 more satellites every week. Um, but what all you can do is consumer pressure. Right. Um, so 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 uh, teach people what's happening in orbit. Most people have no idea that this is happening. Um, the uh, IAU, right, the same, the same body that demoted Pluto, uh, they have a satellite uh, pollution group now. Um, and they have some fantastic uh, uh, resources for just like, what is the problem? Why is this happening? What does this do for astronomy? Um, so if you just Google IAU CPS, you will find the website and find these resources. Um, you know, playing with, with these apps that visualize uh, how much the night sky will change. Is, is really helpful. Show this to people. Um, uh, it, it, I don't know if it, any of your friends uh, you get a call about a UFO that's actually Starling, right? Um, uh, follow local reporters, right? Um, I, I think there are enough of these stories now that uh, journalists should be talking about this, right? Why are they changing the night sky for the entire world and not actually teaching anybody anything? And of course, all of you are already part of amateur astronomy clubs and you're doing fantastic work uh, with, with light pollution. Um, and uh, thank you. <laughs>
Um, and also, many of you already do this, uh, showing people the night sky. Thank you. That is so important so that people know what they are losing, especially kids. Um, so uh, thank you for continuing to volunteer with that. It makes such a big difference. And then I'll just say it. Don't buy internet from Starlink, right? There are there are other options. Like I realize, like I live in a rural place. My neighbors use Starlink, right? Um, I can hook up my house to uh, an electric line, a gas line, even though I'm 10 kilometers from the nearest town, right? But I don't have broadband internet, right? Uh, the the uh, government investment in this is non-existent. Uh, so I understand why people are jumping on it. Um, there's other satellite internet operators that are in geosynchronous orbit that are not uh, going to be as devastating to uh, you know, the sustainability of, of, of future use of orbit. Um, and talking politicians, this is super important and uh, really horrible to do. But um, here's this, this uh, you know, advocating for better rural and remote uh, internet. Uh, there's this great, great chart showing all of Canada, how many people have access to uh, broadband internet in different places. Uh, Alberta is pretty uh, you know, great in urban places, terrible in rural places, and really terrible uh, on First Nations. Um, so this is this is an area where adv advocacy can make a huge difference. If people have good access to internet, they don't need satellite internet. And then, of course, there's lots of groups that are already fighting. Um, uh, Dark Sky International is a fantastic group. Many of you are already part of it. Thank you. Uh, IAUCPS, as I mentioned, um, they're, they're a great group. They're uh, snowballing now. Uh, the American Astronomical Society has a, a committee specifically dedicated to light pollution in all forms, including satellites. And I know many of you do great uh, light pollution advocacy. So thank you. Um, but you know, we really we're at this point now where uh, you you see it presented as a choice. It's like, oh well, if you want dark skies, then you hate people and uh, you're you're standing in the way of progress. And it's like, no, no, we shouldn't have to choose between these two, right? With with good regulation of satellites, uh, good engineering, cooperation between companies, uh, then we can still have both. Uh, but we we do have to fight for it. So. Uh, so thank you. Um, I hope that you have lots of questions about lots of pressing stuff, but I'm happy to answer uh, questions about the depressing stuff too. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you so much, Sam. Yeah. And we can tell how passionate you are about all of this. <laughs> um, I, we're going to go to our Q and A right now, but before, why don't we do that? Um, Jeff, I wonder if we could put Starlink in the dome oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll use that as a backdrop for questions and whatnot. Sam, come on over. Yeah. Um, questions from the audience. So, so uh, actually, what we're looking at here, you can start to see the Starlink. And unfortunately, um, they're a lot brighter than everything else that we were looking at in the night sky. They're pretty bright. Yeah. 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 This, this, so, so this is just showing where they are, right? So the, the simulations that I ran also have, it basically the Earth's shadow projected through, right? So, so not all of them are going to be uh, sunlit at the same time. And the ones toward the horizon are going to be darker just because they're farther away from me. Um, but there's there's ones that are straight up. Those are going to be those are going to be bright. Uh, and in the summertime, there will be some up there and sunlit all night long from from these latitudes where we live. And and this represents about one eighth of the target number of satellites that are going to go up. Is it, this is current. Yeah. yeah. Update every week. Oh. This this application that that Jeff from the Telespark is running is updated weekly. Wow. The question that I want to is why, well, one, why do they need so many? Nobody has ever uh, justified that. And why do they have to be at the same altitude? Why can't they spread it out a bit so they don't crash into each other if we have a solar storm? So, yeah. Huh. Well, if I might make a comment, I did a quick calculation on the amount 29 times. Of yeah. The uh, that amounts to about 70% of the total 
volume of meteorite material that falls per centimeter of every day. Yeah, yeah, seventy percent. Um, Roland, could but, you, oh, yeah. you repeat that? Oh, sure. Uh, there was a, a slide that showed 29 tons of uh, re-entry material per day uh, in the future, and that is equivalent to 70% of the total meteoritic, meteoritic material that falls to Earth every day. So it's a huge influx. Yeah, and meteorites are mostly rocks, right? This is mostly aluminum and like weird computer parts and stuff, right? It's not the normal composition, so it's very different. I, I was uh, interviewed by CBC a few years back when I was president of the National Society. And um, I suggested that these satellites are the new plastic bottle. Oh. Um, it's, you know, and, and people just aren't aware of it yet. Yeah. Um, you're right, we need to get the message out. Um, questions from the uh, from the group here in the room? Assuming that you're maybe unsuccessful at changing what going to happen here? Are there any sort of, you know, software techniques, you know, data subtraction, knowing where all these satellites are that you can remove that from your data yes. and, and at least, you know, in some part overcome this obstacle? Yes. And I have, I am not like there. Yeah. So you can, you can remove it. Like my team is working on ways to do it. There are, you know, every, every team of astronomers who does research on wide field imaging is working on this right now because it is, the newest, biggest source of noise in all of our images, right? Um, so there is ways to, there are ways to remove that. Um, uh, trying to, you know, try to, you know, calculate your point in so that you don't get one, like <laughs> when they're changing all the time, that requires a huge computational uh, investment that I don't think anybody has done yet. Um, or like some kind of guide camera that, you know, again, like, hardware and software investment. Um, uh, and But like, I'm really not actually that worried about the research. Um, like I'm sad that it'll get, that, you know, my research that's taxpayer funded is getting less effective um, because of the actions of a private company. That makes me really angry. Um, but there are workarounds, right? Like we will figure stuff out. But there's no there's no software uh, that can fix your eyeballs to not see these right. Um, so that that's the part that that makes me much more sad is just knowing that you know my kids will know a different night sky than I know. That that that's very sad. Thank you, Sam. Other questions from here? Simon, um, do you have any questions from our uh, our folks on Zoom? I sure do. Uh, first question is, should Canada build a large Arctic telescope since there are fewer satellites there? Oh, uh, there's there's actually um, been research on that. I know um, a professor at UBC has done some work on uh, on an Arctic telescope. The, the uh, seeing uh, conditions are also excellent in the Arctic. Uh, the only problem is that it's, you know, even worse than Saskatchewan and Alberta winters, right? So there's a lot of uh, problems there. Um, uh, but yeah, as for like getting away, like doing that specifically just to get away from satellites, um, well, what if they suddenly decide that like, oh, Antarctica is a great market and we're going to put a whole bunch of satellites on polar orbits <laughs> to get that market, right? Um, well, yeah, it, it's not a good investment just for uh, avoiding satellites because we don't know what they will do. We have no power there. Thank you, Sam. Simon, any others? Yep. Uh, will the data that will be generated by the Vera Rubin telescope be helpful to your investigations into the Kuiper Belt objects, or will Starlink make Vera Rubin obsolete? Uh well, it's not going to make Vera Rubin obsolete, but it's going to make it less effective, um, for sure. Like, it's already, like, right, you know, once they have first light uh, in, in a few months, I think. I mean, it's, it's very soon now. Um, uh, but there's already so many satellites that uh, things will be, um, will be very different. Uh, yeah, the, the, there will be lots of satellite streaks in the very first Vera Rubin telescope. Um, Vera Rubin will discover thousands of new Kuiper Belt objects, um, but not as faint, right? So um, the Clapton Survey, like we're specifically looking for very, very faint 
very, very distant type of objects. Um, and uh, so severe erosion will not find those. So we still do need like targeted uh, observing besides the severe erosion won't solve everything, but it'll help a lot. <laughs> Great. We have another question. Uh, what are the methods to collect these wastes and what would the costs associated with them be? Like the waste, uh, like satellites in orbit? Like waste stuff? Yeah, I, would, I, I believe, yeah, satellite yeah. waste or... Um, uh, nobody's done it yet. <laughs> like, I've seen lots of ideas for startups, like, oh yeah, we're going to collect all the space junk, but I've never seen anybody actually do it. Um. Uh, so yeah, so I don't think anyone has figured out how expensive it's going to be. Um, one thing that would really help all of this is if um, lower orbit was legally considered an environment. Right now it is not, so it's not subject to environmental regulations at all, even though it's intimately tied to our atmosphere. Um, so if there was a court case that decided that, um, I mean, it would have, well, that would help in the U.S., um, but uh, it needs to be international again. So, yeah, uh, the long answer. Yeah. Hey, uh, Sam, great talk. Thanks so much. For the people in the dome who have the stars overhead, I was wondering if you could use a laser pointer and maybe point at Orion or something we can identify and just give us a sense of the field of view of Mega Cam oh, on yeah. the CFH or the Vera Rubin field of view. Okay, so Vera, so Vera Rubin, I'm not as uh, familiar with. Uh, CFHP is, um, right, it's one square degree. So, uh, so I don't know, how big is it? Can you put the moon up? Do you have the moon? Yeah, put the moon, because the moon is one quarter of that, right? So, uh, so, so. I see the moon, it's about me. Oh, there's the moon, right? So, so that's one quarter of the field of view. Yeah, good idea. Thanks for that visualization, right? So, so just watch that spot. See how many satellites fly through in the next, you know, <laughs> next few seconds, right? That's that's the kind of uh, red pollution that we're dealing with uh, from Mauna Kea, from anywhere. Sorry, a technical follow-up question. For yeah. The, for the theater people, is the moon oversized on the screen, or is that actual size? And another question for us in the dome, what's the, the different colored satellites? Red are space and the green are optic satellites, and the white are And what's neat here, you can really see um, the different orbits, right? So lower orbits, right? Kepler's laws again. Um, lower orbits are going faster, both because they're closer to us and because they're orbiting faster because they're uh, lower some major axis, right? So the ones that are going slower are higher up. Did you say the red ones were space junk? Yeah. yeah. The green ones are okay, that's all my questions. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Oh, Sam, thank you for that. Any other questions in the theater here? I guess I, I'm going to find my way to one more. Who said you don't get exercise doing astronomy? <laughs> I didn't know I got the mic. Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm on the spot. Um, do you know if there's has been any work done on the impact this has on radio astronomy? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I totally ignored radio astronomy, and I keep doing that, and I need to stop ignoring radio astronomy. I'm sorry. Um, so Starlink has already been detected in uh, in in a lot of radio uh, observatories. Uh, it's, it's, I think, it's very low frequency that it's sort of, like, leaking at. <laughs> That's not supposed to be broadcasting in those frequencies. Um, and it flies right over radio quiet zones, right? Um, and uh, there's actually, so having talked to radio astronomers, a lot of what they're worried about is actually, as, so you can see the effect here, right? When you look closer to the horizons, you can see the density is higher, right? Just like as you're looking farther away from you, there's just more satellites piled up. Um, 
uh, just because of geometry, right? And you can actually get reflections of terrestrial radio broadcasts off of those satellites that will make it to your radio quiet zone. So there's all sorts of effects that are really bad for radio astronomy. Um, the FCC also just a couple of days ago uh, approved direct to sell uh, satellites, which means that they're going to be super, super powerful compared to uh, even Starlink satellites. Uh, so radio astronomers are terrified what the implications are for that. Sit down this part. Other questions from in the dome? Simon, do we have any more online? Uh, just a comment that could be a potential question. And um, somebody's just concerned as to who or what countries will have access to these and how they could be used in questionable manners. Oh, well, I mean, I don't know if you've followed some of the headlines about like, oh, they just gave Starlink access to Ukraine. Oh, they just turned it off while the Russians attacked them. Ah, right? Like there's already really, really questionable things happening, right? Uh, Starlink has already been militarized. It's already got a huge amount of U.S. military funding, right? Um, so uh, it's already being used <laughs> questionably. Um, and uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's a private corporation. It's it it should I don't know what to say. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not right. Like there's so much of this that I've just been thrown into that like. I don't know how this government stuff works. I'm just an astronomer. <laughs> um, I don't want to know how this works, but you know, we we had to had to learn it as as things change quickly. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Simon. Is, have we exhausted our questions online and comments? Oh, we have one more question. He's going to yell. It's Phil Langell again. Yeah. Go ahead, Phil. Is there a is planet there, nine is the question. Is there a planet nine? Um, I would say, so it, So the planet nine theory of a 10 Earth mass planet on a very distant orbit, I'm going to go out on a limb and say no, but also give me more data to make sure that that's true. <laughs> that's how this works. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're you're reminding me of that theory of nemesis. I think it was in the oh, yeah. 80s yeah. when there was a, a a brown dwarf companion yeah. that explains the wobble of the sun in our orbit around the center of, or in, in our Milky Way orbit. Um, the whole idea of disturbing comets from the Kuiper Belt or cloud and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. whatever uh, happened to that. <laughs> uh, I think I think Mike Brown who did a, a lot of the Planet Nine uh, paper writing, uh, gets a lot of weird emails about that still. <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> From what I've heard. <laughs> I'm sure he does. That was an interesting read in the day. Yeah. It, was. it was. Well, Sam, thank you so much. That that yeah. was very thought provoking and educating everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a fan of history and I'm, I, sadly, I think that we're going to have I mean, with the number of satellites that we see in the sky and the number of satellites that are that are planned to go into low Earth orbit, unfortunately, it's probably going to take some kind of catastrophic and cascading event to bring it to people's attention to get and to get people to do something because it, it, it doesn't seem that a passive message is working. Um, but with 6,000 satellites and near misses every day, I can't imagine when we get to the 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 mark, um, Murphy's Law will start to play a role and things will happen. I mean, we have the red dots. For those of us in the dome here, we can see the red dots. Those are non-functioning satellites. Um, and we've seen some ca catastrophic and cascading events in, in orbit with just I'll say the handful of satellites that we've had in the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, okay. please do. Um, so yeah, there was a near miss between two bus sized satellites last week, two weeks wow. ago. Um, 20 meters. They missed each other by 20 meters. And they were both one was a non-functional satellite and one didn't have any thrusters. So like we're right on the edge. And if you get one collision like that in Starlink's orbit, mm -hmm. we're in Kepler syndrome, right? Like yeah. there will be um the the 
the thing that, I don't know, I don't know whether the whole part happens sooner, so there's less debris when it happens, or like, um, but uh, Earth will get rid of that, right? Like, yeah. uh, it will take decades, um, but all of that debris will, will burn up in Earth's atmosphere, and the mm -hmm. lower orbit will be usable again someday, so uh, I don't know. I hope we don't get there, but that's it's looking more and more likely. Right, right, I agree.